Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Abe Denmark. I'm the director of the Asia program here at the Wilson Center. Um, we're very uh, glad to have you all today uh, to uh, discuss the geopolitical implications of a new era on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we're very thankful uh, to the uh, Japanese Embassy uh, to the United States for their support uh, for this conference, uh, as, as well as to the many scholars who've come to speak with us today, especially um, Professor uh, Soy, Professor Akiyama for coming all the way from Japan. We're very appreciative of them coming here. Uh, a mentor of mine once told me that uh, in, when you give a speech in Washington, you start with a joke. When you give a speech in East Asia, you start with an apology. Um, so I'll begin by apologizing for the delayed start. As somebody originally from Colorado, the fact that we uh, closed down or, or delayed for an in, in, uh, inch of snow and a little cold is always sort of baffling to me. Um, but we're very glad that you all could come. We've just decided to shorten our first panel here, um, which will end on as planned at 1145. Um, it, you know, at the Wilson Center, we, were, um, we, we pride ourselves on our regional studies and our, our, our regional work. Uh, the University of Pennsylvania's survey of uh, think tanks from around the world rated the Wilson Center as number one in the world for regional studies. And so um, that's why I'm, most ex I'm so excited about our first panel here where we have uh, some of the, uh, the stars of our constellation of experts um, uh, with uh, Robert Daly, the director of our Kissinger Institute on China, uh, Matt Rajansky, the director of our Kennan Institute, and uh, Jean Lee, the director of our Ken uh, Korea Center, and Katie Stollard Blanchett, our uh, a fellow uh, here uh, focusing on Asia and history. Um, and to, to get us started, looking at the geopolitical implications of di diplomatic success um, for the region. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Katie to get us started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abe. Let me also add my welcome here to the Wilson Center. With those of you who have made it through the call to be here in person and those watching uh, live online via the webcast. Uh, my name is Katie Staller Blanchett. I am, as Abe said, a fellow here at the Wilson Center where I'm researching uh, the use of World War II history in present day Russia, China and North Korea. Before coming here, I was based in Beijing in China for the British broadcaster Sky News where I also covered the wider region, which was often dominated by the Korean Peninsula, where it felt like we were covering missile tests uh, on a weekly basis at one point in 2017, disproportionately early on a Saturday morning. There were three nuclear tests during my time there. I was also able to travel to North Korea twice. Uh, before that, I was based in Russia, where I coincided with the crisis in Ukraine, where I covered the street protests in Kiev, the annexation of Crimea, and the subsequent conflict in East Ukraine. So I may be a jinx. But if we're not, we have assembled a, our all-star panel here of Wilson Center directors who, uh, I, I won't repeat all the biographies, but we're delighted to have Jean Lee, Matthew Rojansky, and Robert Daly with us. I thought I would just start with a few opening remarks for context here at the start of our discussion, which is foreshortened, so I will keep this pretty brief. Uh, first, just to acknowledge how much has changed in the last 12 months. This time last year, we were just coming up to the Winter Olympics in South Korea. We had just had the exchange over who had the bigger nuclear button on his desk. I was working on a report for Sky with the subtitle Last Chance for Peace and a montage of Kim Jong-un watching uh, missiles being launched. We had just had North Korea's sixth nuclear test in 2017. There were tests of intercontinental ballistic missiles, missiles being fired over Japan, triggering that country's emergency sirens. There were also escalating rhetorical threats, Donald Trump threatening fire and fury and to totally destroy North Korea, Kim Jong-un threatening to tame Donald Trump, who he called the dotard, with fire. Conflict was starting to look like a real possibility as journalists in the region. We were starting to make contingency plans, looking at where we could go, how we would be able to cover this, what sort of equipment we were keeping in the bureau. Now we are likely several weeks out from a second summit between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump after a flurry of letters and watching the blossoming of what the US president has called a very special relationship. Of course, all that can change back just as quickly, but our panel is looking at the geopolitical implications of diplomatic success with North Korea. So for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna assume that this continues to go well. So we are short of time, so I want to get stuck right into the questions and turn first to Jean Lee here, who's going to be offering a perspective from South Korea, but also drawing on your extensive time in North Korea. 
So I wonder if you could set out for us firstly in the run-up to this second summit, looking like Hanoi or Da Nang in Vietnam in late February, what are some key issues to look for out of this? And is one of the potential risks of diplomatic success that we see announcements, perhaps an end of the war declaration, but with no real concrete movement towards denuclearization? So, first of all, I want to say it's so exciting to have Katie at the Wilson Center, and I'm very happy to have another former journalist who's covered North Korea on the ground, because that is certainly a perspective uh, we don't often get in this sphere. Uh, I would say that success from this second summit really varies according to how you define that. Uh, but I will look more closely at how the, the Koreans define that, and by that I mean the North Koreans and the South Koreans. You only have to look at the pictures that North Korea's own state media put out immediately after his envoy, Kim Jong-chol, went back and reported to Kim Jong-un, uh, those pictures of, of Kim Jong-un looking absolutely gleeful at the results, uh, tell me that he has received some assurance that this will go well according to his definition of success. Uh, it's very interesting to have those pictures published so quickly by North Korea state media. They tend not to announce uh, events that are going to happen. And there we are starting to see a change in how North Korea puts its information out. It's certainly putting out information more quickly, but this to me indicates that they're fairly confident that they're going to get what they want at this upcoming summit. So the question is, what is that? And what are the implications of that? Uh, and, and for that reason, I have said very clearly uh, in, in my broadcast, my interview here at the Wilson Center and, of course, in other media, that it's absolutely essential that the U.S. government use these next few weeks to nail down a very clear roadmap of what's going to happen at this, not only at this summit, but in um, the weeks, months, and years ahead because that is what we didn't have from the last summit. And I was supportive of starting the process of diplomacy with North Korea. But it's absolutely important that with this next summit, we have more than just a handshake, that we have a very clear set of steps. We know exactly what it is the North Koreans are going to offer to, what steps they're going to take very concretely. And, and also, the North Koreans need to know what the United States is going to do in return. Now, going back to that issue of what might happen there. I do think that the one concrete thing that, that North Korea may have gotten is a promise on perhaps, and I'm just speculating, an end of war declaration, and, and, and you mentioned that in your question. The finding some resolution to the Korean War is something that Kim Jong-un's father and grandfather died without having accomplished. Kim Jong-un, in his first speech as leader in April 2012, and I was there at Kim Il-sung Plaza when he made the speech, ended that speech saying, forward to the ultimate victory. We have to go back and look at what it is, what mission was laid out to him when we think about what his ultimate objectives are, and certainly resolving this issue, this longstanding issue with the United States is one of them. Now, if they were to sign a political declaration at that, uh, at that meeting, wherever it happens to be, um, that's not a peace treaty. I think a peace treaty would take much longer, perhaps even years, to uh, sort out and hash out. But it would, both the South Koreans and the North Koreans have made a very compelling case for starting the process with at least a declaration um, that would allow Kim Jong-un to go back to his people and tell them, look, I've... I've settled the issue of whether we're at war with North Korea and we can move forward. So it's a very interesting and compelling argument on the part of the Koreans, North and South, to at least try to get that issue out of the way. But it does carry some serious consequences and implications. And I think that those are some of the issues that we should be discussing, if not in this first panel, perhaps in later sessions. Thank you. Matthew, let me bring you in from the Russian perspective here. We had a story in the Washington Post yesterday, right. since denied by the Russian ambassador, that Russia had offered to build a nuclear power plant in North Korea in exchange for dismantling nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. What are Russia's interests here? How does the Kremlin view North Korea? Uh, thanks, Katie. It's really a pleasure to be with you this morning. I, one of my favorite things about being at the Wilson Center is working with colleagues who, who have really deep expertise uh, about other parts of the world. 
And the great thing about being the Russia guy is that I kind of always get to be at the table. Because uh, as the Russian ambassador reminded us, I think it was in 2000, uh, 14 or 15, when our president, our then president, Barack Obama, said that Russia is merely a regional power, he said, yes, we agree, if you define the region as stretching from the Sea of Japan to the Baltic and from the Arctic to the Middle East. So <laughs> I, I get to be part of a lot of conversations. This one is one of the more interesting ones, and um, I'm cognizant of the, of, of the factor of history. Uh, obviously, uh, the Russian relationship with North Korea, with the Kim family, uh, goes back to the very founding of the regime, uh, to Kim Il-sung himself, uh, right, having been uh, effectively an officer raised up in the ranks of the Red Army, uh, equipped, supplied, supported. Um, so this is definitely um, a matter of historical and political significance for Moscow in the vein of many other partner and client states around the world, uh, including ones in which Russia has been very actively engaged uh, in the last few post-Soviet decades. But that doesn't necessarily lead to any particular scenario for Russian involvement going forward. Russia is very flexible, very opportunistic uh, in its current engagement, and I would say seeks a degree of balance that might be surprising given the history. Um, balance is very much in Russia's interest for a number of reasons. Number one, economically, under pressure from principally Western sanctions, uh, as well as its own uh, considerable economic challenges, structural and otherwise, uh, there is great value in having outlets in the East, not only China, but also South Korea and Japan. And, and Russia has actively pursued and cultivated those relationships, including most recently gestures towards Japan, um, which I think that the Russians could reasonably pursue on their own merits, uh, hoping for some kind of uh, you know, important uh, or at least symbolic concessions from Tokyo, uh, but also could couch as creating a favorable atmosphere for diplomacy in East Asia, right? That is a win-win for the Russians. Um, I I'm not going to go through the litany of potential Russian uh, economic and security interests uh, on the Korean Peninsula, but suffice to say they're considerable. They're not radically different than what they've been for three decades. So if we go back to the agreed framework negotiations and the last round of significant crisis before Kim Jong-un in, in the 1990s, and the Russians played roughly a similar role. And that's why I think that the story about the offer to build um, controlled fuel cycle civilian nuclear capability on the Korean Peninsula is not at all surprising. This is the position that Russia and Ross Adam, which is the state uh, um, nuclear energy uh, and, and nuclear services monopoly, has played all along. And I think it's actually a reasonable topic of conversation to the extent that it has been a part of conversations around Iranian denuclearization or, or nuclear control, um, and to the extent that Russia obviously is one of the top two or three global nuclear suppliers. It's, it's not at all surprising. Now, the dimension, I think, that has ga uh, garnered a lot of attention and that may be raising hackles in Washington is this idea that the Russians have a secret diplomatic strategy of their own, that they would swoop in with a better offer, that they would try to capture the stage. My reading of the Russian interest at this point is that it is probably uh, not so well defined. The idea that the Russians have an end game for which they would like to take responsibility is actually higher risk than any of the diplomacy we've seen from Moscow towards no North Korea thus far. It's far lower risk for the Russians, I think, to wait. Uh, to let the Chinese be in uh, more of a kind of burden-bearing position from the kind of sponsors and friends of Pyongyang side, and to absolutely let U.S. diplomacy play out. It is only to the advantage of Moscow whether the meeting appears to be successful and is the beginning of a very, very long process, or is unsuccessful and the United States has egg on its face. Either one is potentially advantageous for Moscow. There is no question, though, in the long run, and I'll just end on this because uh, I think it, it dovetails with what both of my colleagues had said, um, the Russians' interests in the Korean Peninsula are not inherently incompatible with what the United States would like to see. Um, continuity, exchange, some type of normalization, obviously a formal end to the war, are all things that are consistent with Russia's desire to be a player in East Asia, both in economic terms, and we know that that really begins with energy, um, though it need not end there, uh, as well as in security and political terms. And Russia, Russia will be present. It has been present up to now. Um, but again, it's the, it's the idea of leadership, strategy, 
setting an agenda for an end game and taking risks that I want to try to kind of pull a little bit off the table, a little bit out of the spotlight. I think that those are the wrong questions for Moscow right now. Robert, my impression when I was in Beijing is that there was no love lost between Xi and Kim. I think we had seen no meetings with a Chinese leader for the first five years that Kim was in power. Now we've seen four right. in the last 12 months. What is the perspective from Zhongnanhai from Beijing on this? I think if we go back to your original framing, where were we a year ago? Mm -hmm. One of the striking changes uh, within Beijing is that there's really very little sense of urgency about these issues now on China's part compared to where we were a year ago. And that for at least two reasons. One is that China is far more concerned with its own domestic issues, in particular its economic situation and issues on its periphery, for example, in Xinjiang. And also China uh, is very much involved now with foreign policy issues, particularly with the United States, uh, the ongoing economic spat, but also with the blowback to what it calls its Belt and Road investments around the world. And those would seem to be higher uh, level priorities for China now. So that's one reason there isn't much urgency in China. And the other, and this will echo some of what Matt just said, is that overall China is fairly content with the direction or with the nature of the stasis, if that's the better way to put it, uh, since the original Singapore summit. Uh, the fire and fury rhetoric is gone. Uh, we are now involved in a long-term protracted process, and this is where China is most effective in its diplomacy and where it sees itself maximizing its interest, a, a diplomatic process primarily between uh, North Korea and Washington. It is also now framed as a phased negotiation, uh, which means that the United States will be expected to give something up at, at each phase, uh, even as North Korea does. And this could be conducive to China's original prescription, which was something along the lines of a freeze for freeze. Another nice thing about this phased pairing from China's point of view is that internationally and within China, it casts the United States and North Korea as equals in which neither has the moral high ground. And this is also an, an enormous difference from over a year ago where the focus was properly on North Korea's illegal program, which had been built in part with help from China. Uh, that is now not the international framing. It is Trump and Kim, no moral high ground in either case, with China now broadly speaking cast as what it would like to be cast as, the adult in the room uh, who stands by. China likes that. In terms of the relationship with Kim Jong-un, she would seem to be in the role that he has sought all along. Uh, the deeply interested, constantly consulted great power uh, whose interests must be met and to which Kim is somewhat more deferential, uh, if not wholly compliant. So that's another major box checked for Beijing. Kim also seems to be more interested in developing its economy, which has always been China's prescription for North Korea to follow the Chinese model. So China has checked most of its boxes, has the, the sort of discussion, the debate it wants in North Korea, and it has done this at essentially no cost to China. Now, Chinese would argue that the sanctions have in, incurred a cost on China, and that's, that's um, I think that can be argued against. Uh, if there is a cost there, it is, it is certainly minor and pales in comparison to what China has gained. So success for China, I think, with the next summit is a continuation of the same. Uh, a, a long, drawn-out process. Again, there is no imminent problem vis-a-vis -vis North Korea that China feels that it must solve now, and that gives it the diplomatic space that it needs. And following that, I would conclude really by echoing everything that Matt just said uh, with relation to you know, Russia's degree of, of satisfaction and wanting a continued uh, discussion in which it is likely to win under any of the scenarios that seem to be plausible right now. To say that China is getting everything it wants, just in closing, I don't mean to imply uh, that China is winning in a nefarious way or a way that we should necessarily oppose. It could be that China's uh, views on the proper diplomatic approach are the best that we could hope for over the long run. So this doesn't necessarily, the fact that it's working so well for China, doesn't necessarily speak against American interests. Dean, let me ask you about the South Korean government side of this, and in particular, the risks there in terms of the alliance between the United States and South Korea. If this continues to go well and North Korea is continuing to develop a relationship with the United States, could we see more pressure on the South Korean government to pay more for defense sharing arrangements there, potentially pressure to bring US troops back from the Korean Peninsula, 
Are there far side security risks to the South Korean government in this? So when we talk about the con possible consequences, if they were to sign an end of war declaration, uh, on the one hand, while it would give Kim Jong-un, as I mentioned, uh, the propaganda that he needs at home to tell his people, look, we can now focus, instead of focusing on uh, fight, hating the Americans and mm -hmm. fighting against the Americans, we can focus on building the economy. On the other hand, it will give the North Koreans some leverage, uh, not only uh, with the United States, by, and, and also with the South Koreans, because they'll say, if we are friends now, why do you need to have military exercises? Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, do we trust the North Koreans to truly stick to any agreements that may be made with any end of war uh, political declarations? And I would say, I think you have, to be, you have to be optimistic, but also very skeptical. I do think the North Koreans will want to hold on to as many of their nuclear capabilities and military capabilities and increasingly cyber capabilities and have those ready to go so that they can provoke and remind South Korea at any point that they still have the capability to destroy their way of life and their sense of security. Um, now, so the, but at the moment, um, the South Koreans are advocating for this end of war political declaration. And if they're pushing for that too quickly and too hard, there's clearly gonna be some friction with their partners um, in the United States who are saying, hold on, we need to make sure that our military, our security interests, not only on the Korean Peninsula, but in the region, are protected. And so if you see that, and we've talked about this quite a bit here at the Wilson Center and in this fear that, that the, the difference in that timeline could, could cause some uh, tension in that long-standing alliance. But I will say that I do think the South Korean and American alliance, the U South Korean US alliance is very long-standing and is very strong and can withstand this process. But we will probably see uh, some tension in, in a discussion of how this timeline is going to work out. Uh, I do think that the, um, the, the, Korean, the North Koreans have an objective, which is to try to get the South Koreans on their side on a couple issues, which is to remind them that this is a country that has suffered from foreign intervention for hundreds, thousands of years, and to remind them of that history and use that history to build a, a sense of unity. And they're not only talking about what they call a US occupation, but Japanese colonization. So the, the North Koreans are actively trying to recruit the, ja uh, sorry, the South Koreans in, in creating, uh, building on that, that Korean sense of unity and, and trying to sideline the Japanese as well. So it's not just an issue with um, a, a fracture in the relationship between the United States and South Korea, but North Korea is actively trying to sideline Japan and build some tension in that trilateral relationship, Japan, South Korea, and the United States. So those are things we need to watch out for. Robert, let me ask you about that. I mean, would that suit China's interests quite well to have Japan become the villain of the peace and to increase pressure for the United States to reduce its posture in the region, have no reason to deploy THAAD? How well, as we've set up on this stage many times. Uh, China, I think, sees North Korea, the East China Sea, the South China Sea as different regions in a broad, balance of power struggle or issue with, with the United States. And so any diminution of the United States uh, presence or power could, could be in China's interest. I have not seen uh, formal statements, I may have missed them, out of Beijing about uh, the supposed buzzing uh, by a Japanese plane of uh, South Korean assets. And so I don't want to broadly characterize China's views. I mean, it's obviously it's very easy. We know about the uh, history uh, of Japan Japan and, and China, so it's easy to say yes, they would very much like to see Japan sidelined. But I think at this stage, we need to look to particular actions and, and statements of China rather than broadly characterizing it. And maybe somebody in the audience has seen something, but I haven't seen China commenting on that uh, specifically. And so I, I, I think we should be careful about assuming or, or, or piling on, with, which would have the implication that China was maneuvering some of these issues. And I, I don't know if there's any evidence of that. In terms of what China can offer, and you were alluding in, in your first answer to the, the China model, we know Kim right. Jong-un toured this uh, traditional Chinese medicine factory. What is the model that China is offering? The model is gradual, orchestrated, opening up of the economy, allowing markets and investment in, in a, in a controlled fashion, while keeping the political system. And China has demonstrated the way uh, 
uh, that this could be done on a massive scale. North Korea is obviously on a much smaller scale, and therefore that might be seen as, as more readily achievable. I was struck that you know, President Trump acknowledging this has said, you know, if only they'll open up, you could have beautiful hotels uh, <laughs> in, in these North Korean properties, as though North Korea would be tempted to go for economic reform because of the largesse it would receive from the United States. <laughs> that, I think, is not a great point. Uh, North Korea, even if it does decide to take its own version of the China model, is going to have a limited absorptive capacity uh, for new investment, and that could probably be uh, entirely taken up by South Korean investment over the short term and by Chinese investment into eternity. There's no great <laughs> need for American investment there, so I'm not sure that that is a chip that we get to play in, in, in quite the way uh, that has been suggested. And as, as I said before, it may be uh, that while we would prefer a North Korea with no nuclear weapons, it may be that the China model is the most conducive to stability that you know, we could realistically hope for over the long term. But we, 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 it hasn't really been tested yet. Kim's, Kim's willingness to take those steps has been declared but not really tested. Matthew, in terms of what Russia can offer, I think there's a North Korean delegation in Vladivostok as right. we speak. Right. What sort of economic opportunity does, does Russia see there? Yeah, so again, the premise of this would be that something positive changes. The, the, the economic opportunity, the, the irony is that positive change in the direction of normalization, like a peace agreement, some kind of, you know, integrative steps economically, uh, would change the nature of the benefits that Russia enjoys, but it would still enjoy benefits. So the benefits that it enjoys now are uh, things that are enabled by North Korea's hermit kingdom status, like, uh, you know, tens of thousands of guest workers who are effectively the cheapest, best labor available. Well, if North Koreans get richer, they're not going to be that useful anymore in that capacity. Uh, that said, that's a relatively small loss. Similarly, sanctions busting, right? hey, you can make money off of sanctions busting. Relatively small loss to lose that. Relative to what? Well, the potential gains of, and, and I agree with Robert, right, even if South Korea absorbs all of the economic opportunity of, say, infrastructure building and kind of normalizing of the North Korean economy, there are still benefits for Russia there, not, not the least of which is just connectivity to South Korea geographically, right? Russia's got a border with North Korea. Now, effectively, it would, you know, in this scenario, it would have sort of a border with South Korea, or at least a land corridor. That's very good for Russia. Um, there are certain contracts that for political reasons or even for, for technical and economic reasons, you know, Russia would be well positioned, right? Uh, stuff that has to do with rail, uh, energy transit, i.e. pipelines, certainly anything that's civilian, nuclear in nature, some advanced medical and other things. Um, and then there's no question that the biggest geopolitical benefit or even just kind of domestic political, if you're Vladimir Putin, is the reduced rationale for an American presence, not just on the peninsula, but in the region. Uh, I mean, if you're making a play to push the United States out of the eastern, uh, out of the western Pacific, out of eastern Russia, the way, the way uh, Russians think about it, I mean, you know, the absence of a state of war between the U.S. proxy, the Republic of Korea, and North Korea, Democratic People's Republic, I mean, you know, I'm thinking of the way these things are narrated in Moscow, is it just the, 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 the uh, rhetorical potential of that is essentially unlimited. But I guess the last point I would make is that, again, this is a risk averse, this is a portfolio in which Russia is first and foremost going to be risk averse. I think that the biggest risk factor, um, you know, Ru Russia, let me put it this way, Russia has few cards that would enable it to take an outlier position opposing movement toward normalization, towards reintegration, whatever it might be, um, because it doesn't have constituencies on the Korean Peninsula the way that it has had in other states, former client states, current neighbor states, uh, Eurasian regional states. It has no such constituencies in North Korea, including returned guest workers and things like that. What it does have is an identity of interest with the Kim regime. It is as interested or close to as interested as the Kim regime is in not seeing regime change in North Korea. That is, that is the sine qua non for Russia, and uh, I think that it, it need not take any risk to enforce that position because Pyongyang will be doing everything necessary to ensure that that doesn't happen. And do you think we will see a Kim Jong-un visit to Moscow? You were, you, so you were 
<laughs> important background is that Matthew was in Russia for the Kim Jong Il visit. Yeah, that was pretty cool and totally unplanned. Uh, I was telling some colleagues a story that I ended up actually riding the overnight train, the Red Arrow, the famous Moscow to St. Petersburg overnight train, with a bevy of North Korean functionaries uh, who were not sufficiently elite to ride on the armored train with Kim Jong-il, and it was awesome. And they didn't speak a word of Russian or English, so we just kind of hung out and drank and played cards and things like that. Uh, and then when I actually got to St. Petersburg, I got to see Kim Jong-il zipping by in his, in his limousine. I have a little picture I snapped of that. Um, you know, I was a student, so I had no idea what was going on. But uh, my impression is that you know, Kim Jong-un is not interested in, uh, you know, becoming, remember, look, I'm, I'm not in any way an expert on, on uh, the Korean Peninsula, but my, my impression is this is a guy who's channeling his grandfather, right? You don't throw Moscow under the bus. You don't disrespect, you know, this historic connection between the family and Moscow. Uh, and you take full advantage of all of the, the kind of uh, historically laden imagery in doing a state visit. So at some point, this guy's going to do a visit. Is it going to be May 9th? I don't know. I think that's going to depend on who else he'd have to share the stage with. You know, he could just as easily do his own visit. Um, the idea of the reverse of, of Putin coming, I think, is, is more far-fetched simply because this is really a regional politics issue for Russia in the Far East. It's about Vladivostok development and so on, and that's why we have delegations going back and forth all the time. But I, yeah, absolutely. Kim Jong-un visit to, to Russia, why not? You want to I was just going to make a point, which is that um, what we're seeing now, what, uh, Robert, you referred to this um, turning to China to serve as an economic model mm. is not new. Mm. We have to remember that Kim Jong-il did make a series of trips before he passed away in 2011 to China to learn about this economic model. And the last visit that he made, the last public visit that he made, was to the first supermarket in Pyongyang uh, that was a joint venture with a Chinese company. Uh, and so this was something that he wanted his son, uh, to, he was grooming his son to, to take on. However, Kim Jong-un felt, he made a calculation and decided, you know what, I, I do not want to go into these relationships as this, un this young man that nobody knows who has no power and no leverage. And so he decided to shut everybody out, including Russia, China, uh, and lock himself away and say, I'm going to work on build, ra ra uh, raising tensions so I can build the nuclear weapons that will give me the legitimacy and the place at that table and allow me to sit at that table with the United States, with Putin, with Xi as an equal. So he has masterminded this, you have to admit, pretty um, beautifully for his purposes. Uh, so he is now emerging as a very different figure in 2018 and 2019 than he did in 2011, 2012. I just want to say one thing, which is, and I didn't quite address the South Korean issue um, stake in all of this. At the very, and we haven't mentioned this, but at the very practically speaking, if uh, North Korea wants to improve its economy, if South Korea wants to follow through on these inter-Korean proposals, they need a lifting of sanctions, both UN sanctions that make it very difficult to do anything with North Korea, and also South Korea's own unilateral sanctions that were put into place in 2010 because of North Korean uh, alleged provocations. Um, and until President Moon gets some concrete uh, development out of the U.S.-North Korea relationship, and the United States makes an indication that, okay, we're satisfied that they are committed to denuclearization. We'll start pushing for a lifting of sanctions. That's really only when South Korea as well, and China and Russia, can publicly and formally start to engage North Korea economically. So practically speaking, that's what we need to see happen. But I would say in terms of, um, I just want to make a case for, uh, in terms of the Korean people, South Korea cannot let North Korea um, just languish in the kind of economic um, isolation that they've languished in over these years. It is an impoverished country that is suffering from a lack of base, basic needs. Um, I can't help but when it's as cold as it is now in D.C., think about North Korea. I mean, I even now, and I grew up in uh, a very cold place, but because of what I suffered in North Korea from the cold, from the lack of electricity, I have permanent frostbite. So even in a, in a room as warm as this, I can't feel my fingers. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what it's like for North Koreans. So in a sense, the Koreans have, the South Koreans have to be thinking, we cannot live for decades without dealing with this situation. Um, and some of it might be insurance, right, uh, security insurance. Uh, we will not be able to develop economically or, or uh, as a democracy unless we have uh, a better relationship with the North Koreans. Thank you. Let me open it up for a, a few questions from the audience. We are very short of time, so if I can ask you just to keep your questions very brief, please, uh, and just to give your uh, name and your affiliation before you speak. There is a microphone coming, so if you can wait for it to reach you so we can hear you on the webcast. Uh, the lady up at the back, right at the start here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jerry Hush. I'm a sociologist affiliated with American University. And I have just a brief sort of linguistic question. I'm struck by the continual sort of interchange between the use of the term the various countries, China, and the various people who are leading those countries. And I think we have to be very clear that the change in leadership has altered the relationship and actually altered the conversation. I think in saying Trump and then slash US, I think you have to be very clear that there are people who are <laughs> quite confused as what is the US policy given the lack of stability. Um, and when I look at patterns of action, for example, and the pattern is that there is no pattern. So I think I would be very interested in how can you make foreign policy at this point discussions, especially in the sense I heard um, the need for some kind of structured agreement that would be adhered to and da, da, da. I'm not quite sure that's possible. So I'd be very interested in your commentary. Well, I would say that that's why the next few weeks are so important. We have to see, we should be watching whether the North Korean working level officials are meeting with the US envoy, Steve Began. I know the Nor his North Korean counterpart very well. I spent many days with him and I know he's gonna be a tough partner. So I am a bit skeptical on what it is they're going to accomplish, but it's absolutely important that they map these steps out and get some work done. The North Koreans can, frankly, Kim Jong-un would rather leapfrog over um, these working level officials like Steve Began and Secretary Pompeo and get straight to Trump because he knows that Donald Trump is not doing his homework. Um, so it's, it, it'll be up to uh, members of the administration to make sure that they get those meetings with the North Koreans and lay this all out in, uh, in advance. Just a re related question. I don't know, Jean, if you know the answer to this, but over the next few weeks, we've also got uh, trade negotiations with China, which could determine uh, the, the future course, determine in part the, the near-term future course of U.S.-China relations. Uh, we've got questions about immigration and border. Uh, there are the ongoing issues with the Mueller investigation and now this summit. Any one of these issues could absorb all of the attention of a normal administration. Do we have the bandwidth, personnel, the institutional arrangements needed to get the proper consideration of these issues you've just described by the end of February, given everything else on the slate? I know that on the, on the China side, we're still very worried that the personnel aren't in place. We still don't have an Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia Pacific. How much bandwidth is there within the government to, to tee this up in the right way? It's a related question to the. There are very smart people who know this issue very well uh, working on this next summit. But whether or not they are able to sit down with the North Koreans and hash this out beforehand is really key. I think we're seeing reports that Steve Began the envoy will be going to Asia and perhaps will sit down with North Korean officials, so that's very promising. Um, I believe reports say that the meeting is set for the end of this month, so January 31st or around there. So that's something I'll be watching for closely, is how much face time are they getting with the North mm -hmm. Koreans so they can really hash out their details. And it's up to Trump, President Trump as well to empower his team to do that to give them, to tell the North Koreans, listen, you need to let the officials handle this. They're gonna sort out the agenda. We're not gonna skip over them. They need to do their jobs. And we will meet when and only when we have an agenda mapped out that we agree on. That's good. Uh, gentleman in the front row. I, actually, I see a number of hands up, so let's take three questions at, at once and we can all uh, take a turn to this, this chap here. Hi, uh, Chris McRae. So uh, I'd like to try and pick up on what I think was Jean's last point about actually the peoples of North Korea, because you started by sort of, I think, implying that it was in many of the major powers' interests to sort of take it slowly, slowly, 
But do we know actually how much the people of North Korea have actually been hurting under the sanctions? I mean, has the lot gone down even further in the last 18 months? And, you know, how critical is that vis-a-vis the other reasons which seem to imply slowly, slowly is what is going to happen? Thank you very much. We'll just take another question behind you here. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Akab Malik. I'm a Fulbright Scholar at the Elliott School at the moment. Um, I'm working on BRI, so I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, North Korea, South Korea opening up uh, the necessity, maybe, or the need or desire for the South Koreans to uh, push into Eurasia, uh, take access to the connectivity that's been opening up uh, in the last few years, and the potential for the future and the prospects for greater prosperity there. And uh, North Korea, obviously, is looking at that as well. So what's your opinion on that? Thank you very much. And then on the far side, this lady. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jin Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Would you uh, share with us your vision of the impact of the coming summit? I heard that it may be held in Vietnam. So how would that uh, affect the balance between Vietnam, US, China, and especially the South China Sea? Thank you. Jean, do you want to take first the question about the real effect on, on people in North Korea? The North Koreans are, are very good at living with sanctions, so the regime has been very good at telling its people it's a unilateral policy um, imposed by the Americans, which is not quite the full picture. Uh, and so they have found ways around it. I should note that that supermarket that I mentioned when I went there for the first time in the weeks after it opened in 2012 was mostly Chinese products. Uh, there were very few uh, North Korean products at the time. When I went back in 2017, uh, I would say it was the reverse. So in that time period, North Korea had learned how to make its own products and tried to, is really working on weaning itself off of its dependence on, on China, for example. That said, uh, one of the concerns among the North Koreans uh, was that as sanctions are tightened, they have less access to things like fuel oil, things that really help their factories run, their tra tractors run, um, power the trucks that carry food to the rest of the countryside. Um, so there's no doubt that sanctions are, 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 as they are getting tighter and tighter, going to impact North Koreans. Regardless, though, life is very, very difficult in North Korea. So I think that we should just assume it, life is very difficult whether or not, it, and it cannot continue. And Kim Jong-un knows that. He knows that he can't rule hold on to power for decades if he doesn't address the situation, find a way to lift the sanctions and improve his country's economy. Do you think that needs to be more a part of this conversation, the plight of real lives in North Korea? Well, I do think it gets overlooked in a certain sense because North Korea state media, they're very good at putting out a certain image. They're, they're proud people. They're very good at putting out this image that they, uh, right now they're working on putting out an image that portrays North Korea as a normal country. Uh, Kim Jong-un is a normal leader. But the fact is, it's an incredibly poor country without the very basics of necessities. Pyongyang itself is f relatively modern compared to the rest of North Korea. But if you get a picture of just Pyongyang, then you don't, you're not getting a full picture of what it's like for the rest of North Korea. So I do think we need to keep that in mind, just put things in perspective. Uh, because we have so little access, especially for us as Americans, we, we can't travel there, um, we don't get that full picture. So it's good for us to, uh, to consult with countries that do have access, NGOs that do have access to find out what it's like in the countryside so we have a full picture of what the, what the people are suffering from if we let this process go on. Um, I do think that Kim Jong-un does want a protracted process to a certain degree. He wants a step-by-step -step process because remember that ultimately what he wants to do is hold on to his weapons as long as he can. And a longer process will allow him to hold on to those weapons as long as he can. But the people will suffer as a result. Matthew and Robert, any uh, quick thoughts on the regional power balance with Vietnam's involvement and uh, potential Belt and Road involvement for North Korea? Well, the Belt and Road is, of course, an, an enormous topic, and I'd be happy to, to speak with you. Maybe we could get together one-on-one -on, -one on this. Uh, China obviously claims that Belt and Road is connectivity for everybody, uh, so in theory, South Korea could avail itself of that. Uh, but those we're mostly talking about overland routes, uh, the economics of which uh, still don't really make much sense compared to established 
uh, shipping routes in which South Korea is already extremely developed. And South Korea's, of course, explosive uh, economic relationship with China has already occurred. And so I would say that, that Belt and Road is probably not even a sideshow with reference to these specific issues that we're talking about uh, in this panel. But I would be very interested to hear what, what your own research on Belt and Road involves. Matthew, brief final thought on parabellums. Uh, you know, the, the one point that I wanted to make with respect to an earlier question uh, about the difference maybe between leaders and countries is that, you know, Russia, again, is the physically largest and, and in a certain sense most divided actor here between a kind of European capital, right, which is currently in a conflict with Europe and, and the United States, and then a kind of Asian, you know, Eastern Russian, Siberian reality that is both very close to North Korea and economically quite different, m underdeveloped with constant promises of new development projects that make much, much more sense when the region's wider economy is humming and is interconnected and so on and make much, much less sense when it's not. I actually think that there's a big gap of interest, and I think that local actors in Vladivostok region, the maritime province of Russia, Eastern Siberia would be very, very interested in seeing success, whereas Moscow is more happy to just sort of sit back. And then one very small remark, since you brought up Steve Began, Gene, you probably know, you know, Steve is an old Russia hand. He was a, a Bush administration national security official, and he was at Ford, which uh, Ford made for many years running the most popular foreign cars in Russia. Um, Steve is really well known and respected in Moscow. So if on one of his trips he were to stop in Moscow and read the Russians in on what's going on and so on, I think that would be a, a diplomatic masterstroke, and I suspect that he probably will do that. Uh, not necessarily on this trip, but I think at some point that would be, that would be smart. Thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time, so I want to thank you all for coming. Look forward to welcoming you to our later panels. And I want to uh, thank our panelists for their regional expertise. Yeah. <laughs>